going to be talking about a little man from Greece, not the movie, named Giannis Piccola, or he's known in the, in the small Hollywood circle that worships him, Jack Pierce. Really? That's like the most American name I can think of. Jack Pierce? Giannis Piccola. Uh, Giannis Piccola, yeah. So he's from, or is he from Greece? He's, from, he's from Greece. Really? Yeah, and he moved to the States. Yeah, we were talking about before this, he looks like all American. I didn't say all American. I said he looked like someone who says whippersnapper a lot. To me, that's all American. <laughs> when I think of George Washington, I think the guy says whippersnapper a lot. <laughs> Jack Pierce was the head of the makeup department for Universal Studios during the monster heyday, an era of makeup perfection that has never been as iconic as it was when Pierce was in charge. Iconic as in recognizable iconography. Like Frankenstein's creature from Mary Shelley's novel is nothing like what we see in the 1931 Frankenstein, but every iteration of Frankenstein since then for almost 100 years now has been yeah. branched off from that original one. Our Same with Dracula. Same with Dracula. Our understanding of the looks of werewolves, mummies, and European vampire counts all revolve around Jack Pierce's work. If not directly channeling his looks, then actively avoiding it, but being aware <laughs> yeah. of it. Like, we're going to do a, a vampire, but it's not going to be like yeah. like Dracula. So, like, even if you are using that template, yeah. you're avoiding the template, you're still like aware of it. that guy from Harry Potter. <laughs> you know, uh, Ron Weasley. Okay. <laughs> So let's talk about Jack Pierce. Jack Pierce was born in Greece in May of 1889, which is one of those magical oh years God. before the internet that sound fantastic. One of those magical years before antibiotics that <laughs> I would just love to go back to. Where soap was a new thing. <laughs> um, the Piccolas immigrated to the United States when Giannis was in his teens and they landed in Chicago. But Jack was vying for life as a professional baseball player in Chicago, <laughs> but unfortunately for the Baseball Hall of Fame, that did not come to pass. But looking at him in the little footage that there is of him and even pictures that you get a sense of this scrappy little baseball player of the early 20th century. Like if I look at pictures of him, I'm like, yeah, he would have played baseball. You he, chewing tobacco, uh, you have a hat you throw on the ground. He looks he like- He says whippersnapper. He says whippersnapper, that's the name of his team. He looks like somebody in Looney Tunes that would fight Bugs Bunny. I yeah. can see like brawny forearms. A fedora covering his eyes. Yeah. yeah, he's got like a toothpick sticking <laughs> out and up. Out and up, And yeah. to the left. It's easier to draw that way. He pursued a life in athletics for some time and that career path led to Los Angeles. But once he was here trying to get onto the California Coast League team, it was officially stated Jack Pierce you are too short to play Major League Baseball. <laughs> Even though in Chicago, he was a semi-pro shortstop. That five foot six Janice was simply brushed aside because of his size. And that was, I'm sure, devastating. So baseball didn't work out. And now Giannis is a regular old Fallon here in Los Angeles. And what's what's there to do here, chump? So around this time, he meets his wife, Blanche Craven, which itself is like a monster name. That's the name of a woman who great, falls in Great grandmother of Wes Craven. <laughs> I look, I'm like, is that really? How thought. many Cravens could there be? And then he decides, once he's married to Blanche Craven, decides to change his name from Giannis Piccola to Jack Pierce officially, which his family hates him for. Why? To be more American, I guess. But, I guess he was trying to find jobs and trying to find a job with a... But if you're like, I'm Giannis, they're like, no, 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 no. It's 19 whatever right now. No thanks. So did his wife become a Pierce? No, I think uh, everything I see with her, it's Blanche Craven. Uh, she didn't lose the Craven. She was into the Craven. Yeah, why didn't he take the Craven? Though? I would have taken Jack Craven. Oh, take the, oh, hire that guy. That's almost like Raven. Jack <laughs> oh, Craven. Yeah, Jack K. I'm Jack Raven. Raven. Yeah, Jack. And I'm here to do monster makeup. Oh yeah, then you're hired. Oh, you absolutely <laughs> hired. We're going to get rid of last guy, Teddy Sheep. We're going to get rid of him because Craven's spookier. So he's not playing baseball. He's married. He changed his name to a more American name. Uh, and he starts finding work in a new avenue in its infancy, the entertainment industry of Southern California. First, he starts on the outside working as a theater projectionist. And then he started managing a theater chain I also read he was a Nickelodeon manager. It's probably the same thing. Before sneaking into this. I say sneak, but he probably worked really hard and had direction. So yeah, he started working for studios after that. He worked as a camera loader, a stuntman, assistant director, and a bit player in some acting roles between 1915 to around 1928. He's a stuntman? Yeah, but I, don't, I couldn't find... The, 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 it's very vague about what movies he was doing what for. But I feel like in those days, which was like the late teens, you just kind of yeah. did... Everything was like an independent movie, yeah. it felt like. Yeah. So you're just like, can you do... It's like everything's yeah. a corporate can movie. You, uh, we... we want to drop this house on Buster Keaton again, but <laughs> it, it might kill him this time. So uh, you're Greek. Can you go? Yeah. <laughs> you're a good standing for Buster Keaton. Yeah, you're short. You can. You're short. You're, you're short. short. You look like you couldn't make it in professional baseball. Just like Buster Keaton. Get in there. Get in there. If a train hits you, it probably won't hurt much because you're <laughs> short, I guess. According to IMDb, he played Bolt. Okay, this is names or so of that era. He played Baldy Joe and Misguided. <laughs> kill Patrick in One Dollar's Worth. Uh, Chug Wilson and the Fighting Doctor. Black Pete and the Man Who Waited. And Pedro and Law and Order because every actor throughout time has to be in a law and order. <laughs> That's how you know you've made it. <laughs> Those were just some of his roles. Now, he here's the thing about his acting roles. The studio system back then, as lavish as it was, was also in its infancy and kind of like a mom and pop shop in a lot of ways. I don't know how true it is in this regard, but at the time, Pierce saw a way to get more regular work and it was by doing his own makeup. If he did that, he could put himself into any role like 
Lon Chaney. Like Lon Chaney, if they needed a this thing, oh, I could do the makeup and I could put them myself and you don't have to worry and I'm right. ready for that already. Yeah. So that was his way to get more regular work. He knew he was not going to be a big movie star because uh, he wasn't big. He wasn't even- There's no uh, big movie stars, just short actors. <laughs> that's this. That's the saying. That's the saying back then. You know, a set of bears not going to be hot in the drawers for this little guy. But he knew that he can get roles doing yeah. his own makeup. Who's ever heard of a short leading man? Tom Cruise. Yeah. Charles Manson. <laughs> Who's <laughs> Napoleon. <No. laughs> but he knew he can get roles doing his own makeup. So through his acting career in the 20s, Pierce would do his own makeup, which is why he was getting cast more. And he was getting good at it. From what I could tell, he did his own makeup for The Man Who Waited, Desert Rider, The Speed Demon, and Masquerade, a film from 1929. And he had two people there to inspire him. Jack Dawn, the man who would go on to do makeup for The Wizard of Oz, which was like a big deal at the time. The other person that helped inspire him was the man of a thousand faces in the middle of his heyday, Lon Chaney, who I believe was the, I believe he was the head of the makeup department at Universal at the time. Was he? Yeah, yeah he was so. because he did the Hunchback, Phantom of the Opera, and another big that, that I mean, it's not like he was doing makeup for other people. Yeah, movies. yeah. Well, I th- I don't know. He was the makeup department because he was the only, the only one, one doing the makeup. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else just had like a sh- different shirt on. Universal had not become the house of horror built yet. Uh, it was still making shorts through the 1910s and it was very much, still very much a studio at the baby level. Even though part of the valley was called Universal City, it was still like <laughs> building up. And just to remind everyone, the head of the studio and the founder was Carl Lemley. Just to put that out there because we're going to get to it later. Anyways, while out getting small acting roles, Jack Pierce had begun developing his own makeup skills, learning tricks and tips, and having enough room and know-how to experiment through the 20s. Through Lon Chaney's heyday, Jack Pierce was sort of in the background learning on his own. He started working with Lasky's famous players, then for Vitagraph, as well as the original Fox Studios throughout the 20s. This is what he was doing. His first established big deal makeup job came in 1927, Monkey Talks. Here's a synopsis for that movie. (laughs) It sounds amazing. A bankrupt circus act plans to revive its fortune by disguising a diminutive acrobat as a talking chimpanzee when the acrobat falls in love with a beautiful tightrope walker things go awry that was a movie from 1927 um, and I feel like it could be made in 2021 I think it would I think the world is ready for a remake uh, a, a 24 movie now the actor Jacques Lanier was a star and the director Wal Walsh who went on to he had directed Thief of Baghdad went on to direct White Heat in Roaring Twenties he wasn't satisfied with the monkey makeup for Lanier so Jack Pierce stepped up and did the makeup work and it is astounding it's really ahead of its time like Planet of the Apes level good. I've seen some angles like that kind of looks bad, but there's a couple shots where like that looks like a like a that chimp awesome. man. <laughs> it's a chimp in a suit. That's not a real chimp. So next up for Pierce, he creates one of the most iconic and truly, I say this, truly terrifying makeup jobs on Conrad Viet for the Viet. F- is it Viet? I've always heard Conrad Veit. Is it um, or that- Voight? No, not Voight, not John Voight. It's Conrad Veit. Veit. Okay, we'll say Voight. Conrad Veit. Well, now that we're saying it too much, I feel like I've lost it. I thought it was Conrad Conrad Veit. I don't know how to pronounce German names. Oh, how American you are. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, Hitler. I don't know. (laughs) I'm sorry we didn't all fight for the Allies during World War II. Henry Himmler. Who's that? (laughs) Henry. Um, Hank Himmler. (laughs) (laughs) Jack Pierce is responsible for the makeup job on one of the most scary makeup jobs I've ever seen. The Man Who Laughs in 1928. I thought you were, first of all, I thought you were going to say The Invisible Man. And I was like, yeah, that is quite a makeup job. (laughs) Yeah, that's a lot of bandages that guy has. I love when he throws a nose. Anyways, he does the makeup for the man who laughs, which is uh, which one is that? Is that uh, big smile? Right. Uh, look the at the Joker. You, the, the Joker. Exactly. Uh, I'll, I'm going to mention that in a couple sentences. So give me a minute. I'll cut that out. Let me change that. Uh, the two face. <laughs> look it up if you haven't seen it. It's startling, especially like there's a photo of Jack Pierce when he's putting like a big powdered wig on him and he's got the face. You're like, oh god. For that, he sculpted the grin that went on that white wears. Uh, if you're wondering, yet. <laughs> If you're wondering how iconic this makeup job is, Conrad Veidt's look in The Man Who Laughs is said to be the direct inspiration for the Joker. That's how iconic this thing is, is that it's stemmed into one of the biggest villains of the 20th yeah. century. Yeah, and there, wasn't there even a Batman comic called The Man, the man Who, who Laughs? laughs. Yeah, I Something. believe there's a Man Who Laughs, yeah. What about uh, The One Who Knocks? Isn't that the Joker? That's the Joker when he's selling meth to <laughs> high schoolers. I've only seen parts of that show. <laughs> Jack Pierce did what was referred to as extreme makeup methods, which were impressive. So impressive that they caught the eye of Carl Lemley. So now two things happen. The first is the next year, 1928, Lon Chaney left the makeup department of Universal to go pursue his own independent career. And when I read that, I was like, wow, Lon Chaney is about to go become Lon Chaney. <laughs> nope. He died two years later, his best work being done in the 20s, which were behind him, with Phantom of the Opera, the other one. God, I can't believe I forgot. London After Midnight, mm-hmm. the makeup job 
that launching does is great. We don't know because there's only like five photos that yeah, exist. I've in the seen movie. the recreated version uh, Turner Classic Movie does where it's just a bunch of still photos <laughs> that they string together Spooky. with music. Yeah. <laughs> kind of shake them around. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he's saying here? We wouldn't know because it was silent and also we don't have the footage. <laughs> so not only was there an opening for the makeup department at Universal, there's also an opening in the entertainment industry for the next evolution of makeup work. Mm-hmm. At Cheney's departure from uh, Universal, the still impressed Carl Lemley hired Jack Pierce to be the new head of the makeup department where he would start at the dying days of silent film. The second thing that happened was in 1929, anybody who heard the other episode probably knows this, but I'll reiterate, Carl Lemley- People don't listen to our old episodes. They don't care. You know how old those are? They're seven years old. Um, (laughs) Those were our silent (laughs) silent silent podcasts. Uh, Carl Lemley would give his son, Carl Lemley Jr., affectionately and derogatorily referred to as Junior, this 21st- They called him Carl Lemley Lesser. (laughs) Diet Carl Lemley. (laughs) For his 21st birthday, he got a job as the chief of production at Universal Studios and Junior wanted to make horror movies. He was a big genre fan. Not explicitly but based on the projects he moved forward with he had a taste for horror and now he had the perfect person in the makeup department to bring those horror projects to alive. Um, it, it, he's alive. Um, it's alive. <laughs> the department's the, alive. The department's alive. <laughs> so we're about to enter not only Jack Pierce's heyday lasting from 1930 to 1947. We're about to enter the era of Universal Monsters. So as stated, Cheney changed the game and made huge successes with his work on The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera, London After Midnight. So it was clear that people liked horror movies. Junior wanted to push the genre further and sought to produce films based on classic horror novels. He would start with Dracula and Frankenstein, 1930, 1931. We won't spend too much time talking about- Written by a woman. Well, one of them. You mean, uh, was it a woman who invented horror? Yeah. <laughs> I always wondered if it was true, but they always said that she carried um, Percy Shelley's heart in a bag. Was it Percy Shelley? Whoever her husband was, she carried his heart in a bag. I don't, I don't know, know why you true. doubt that being true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't spend too much time talking about Jack Pierce's work on Dracula because Bela Lugosi, star of Dracula, refused to let Jack Pierce do any work on him. I guess Lugosi, who was theater trained, liked to do his own makeup. But Pierce, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Pierce's main contribution to Dracula's look was his- He liked to do a lot of stuff. Behind a curtain while- Paul Marco watched drugs. Um, um, <laughs> blood. We're talking. Blood. We're talking blood here. Here's the main contribution. Like I just said, was Dra- to Dracula's look was his widow's peak. I'm generally curious to hear if uh, that, that was his big innovation yeah. in makeup. He's balding. He's, uh, he got bitten when he was losing his hair, and now he's stuck in that <laughs> pathetic look he got, forever. He got bit by a vampire bat, and then he got bitten by a bald headed <laughs> bat. He got bit by male pattern baldness. I'm generally curious if to see what his ideas for Dracula would have been. If they were similar, if he helped design the look, or if he was going to make it more like a Nosferatu. We'll never know. We'll never know. But he, he said he helped a lot with the styling of Dracula as well as the Brides of Dracula. I also read somewhere that he designed a special grease paint for Lugosi. So yes, technically he works on Dracula, the first of the iconic Universal Monster movies. Also, the two famously did not get along. Well, That's fine. What's both- grease paint again exactly? I, think I always hear it. What is it? I, you know, I don't really know. It's the kind of, the, I guess the paint that light doesn't bounce off is that right like it's when i think of grease paint i think of what groucho used to draw on his mustache right but that can't be that just looks like grease yeah it must just be like a i have no idea i thought i knew when i read down and now that you asked me like i have no idea uh but in my opinion his best work was right on the corner with universal's other father figure frankenstein's creature played by the lovable and soothing Boris Karloff, who was pretty much an unknown at that time and treated as very disposable. It's important to note that Karloff knew that the role would, let's start off before we talk about what he went through. He was very up for this. He went over with Pierce how awful the makeup process would be. And he was like, I don't have other jobs. Let's just do it. They got Karloff based on, I think the criminal code. And he's just like kind of like a lanky guy, but at the time, very skinny, very like overpowering. So like, you're going to be Frankenstein. Legend is Howard Hawk saw him at a bus stop. No, (laughs) Howard Hawk saw him at a commissary. His brother saw him at a bus stop. Yeah, this is another one of those stories. Like they'll see you eating lunch and they're going to make you a monster. (laughs) You scare me. You ready to scare America? (laughs) I like the way you devoured that uh, ham sandwich. (laughs) So I heard it was Pierce along with Karloff that would meet up at night before they began shooting and talk about different looks and test things on Karloff early on before shooting. Pierce was in also incredibly deep detailed and poured over anatomy books, uh, electronic books, criminology books. He even found what he determined was a criminal look based on criminology books and moved forward with that idea, which sounds like profiling, but we'll get over it. <laughs> Pierce used uh, something called collodion. That's according to the internet, when painted on the skin, collodion dries to form a flexible nitrocellulose film. So it's like liquid plastic that is 24% ether. So it uh, was incredibly flammable. Then there was uh, like cotton as a base, like cotton rolls for the head, cotton for different parts of the body, then collagen 
blended into the skin. The only prosthetic used was the flat part of the creature's head done to imply that Dr. Frankenstein, not being a trained surgeon, would remove the top of the skull, replace the brain, and then reattach very sloppily. <laughs> like carving like, a pumpkin? Like carving a pumpkin. <laughs> like putting the lid on a box, which is why it's square. That's what the square is. In case head. I need to unpack this uh-huh. again. In case I have to move the brain around, I don't want it to be hard to unstitch that. So because there were no prosthetics, the makeup would have to be redone every day. Mm. You get rid of what you did one day mm-hmm. and then it adhered to the skin so taking it off would, was worse it pulled at you <laughs> Karloff reportedly <laughs> slept in the makeup some nights the electrode bolts on Frankenstein's neck were applied using spirit gum which I hear is really strong and apparently Karloff had scars of where the electrodes were on his neck I'm starting the- to think he was Frankenstein after this I think he was <laughs> I think he was just like whatever was left after that movie he was just like I, I don't I get up at 3.30 in the morning every day now. <laughs> I, I, I crave yeah. electricity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to throw little girls in a lake, but you feel bad for me. Jack Pierce used mortician's wax on the eyelids to give the eyes a dead look. Mm. Uh, here's a Karloff trick. So one side of Frankenstein's face is caved in around the cheekbone. Yeah. It has a, a deep indent. Oh, I think I know. It was accomplished by Karloff taking out his false teeth, yeah. his dental bridge, and so one part, like like what, like guy in Skyfall, like Javier Bardem in Skyfall, <laughs> and, his, yeah. and his, his whole face, face just like collapses. You're like, oh my God. Uh, there are also metal braces uh, like a steel rod sewn into the back of his jacket that touched his spine and then there's like quilting around it and the the, pant, the legs of his pants also had these steel rods to stiffen the walk of the creature another Pierce idea as was putting lifts in the boots to make him look taller uh, <laughs> so, a, he could go, so he could disco really well so he could play shortstop yeah that was Jack Pierce's dream he, every single character how about we make lift your taller. we put you lifts <laughs> the thing I cannot do now that I have full control of the makeup department I can create <laughs> my deepest fantasies people with big shoes <laughs> people with big cleats playing for the chicago cubs all of this took five hours to apply and their day started at 3 30 in the morning Oof. then karloff would go off to a, work a grueling 16 hour day in hot heavy prosthetics and wardrobe okay so he has three hours to sleep every night he has three hours to get home and sleep every night but don't forget the makeup also has to come off oh my god so it was about i would say it was about three hours rip of it sleep. off the end of summer so it's hot in the San Fernando <laughs> Valley, wearing prosthetics and heavy quilting. And then he has to lift the little girl and Colin Clive and climb Colin Clive up a fake hill over and over and over. <laughs> While for there's Whale. a lot of fire around While him. While there's a lot of fire around him. It was a really bad, he pretty much created the film actors union after this. <laughs> just so he's like, I can only do 12 hours a day. I am not an animal. That's a different movie. That's but a different, still. but still it's a, the same rule applies. I belong in a union. <laughs> also, Carl Limley reportedly was so appalled at the hideousness of the makeup job that he wanted Karloff escorted through the studio with a veil over his head and Jack Pierce would have to hold the creature's hand and walk him to set. <laughs> That's so sweet. It's so cute. <laughs> After Frank- That's how I got to school. <laughs> Jack Pierce would hold my hand with a veil over my head. Keep the bag over. He'll frighten the other children. Uh, he'll, he'll frighten the little rascals. <laughs> After Frankenstein, Pierce was the star on the Universal lot. Nowhere else. Next up, Pierce and Karloff came the mummy. Another fantastic makeup job yeah. for the aged look of Imhotep when he first awakens. So that's a majority of the work they did what that if, was grueling uh, was the beginning. I've got a new character, Emotep. It's a mummy who's in Green Day. Save it for the sketch show. Thanks. I'll write that down before you forget. Oh, I got one more intro in there. Yeah. <laughs> this will be the last intro ever. <laughs> yeah, for the age look of Emotep when he first wakes up, because that's like a majority of the work they put into was when Mommy first comes alive. It was another grueling task, another eight hour day under the brush of Jack Pierce. It was another collagen and cotton job with more spirit gum and linen bandages that had to be cooked so they looked aged and burnt and fragile. And then dirt and other effects were applied to that. Pierce, this was Jack Pierce's favorite thing he ever did. <laughs> this was the best, his best work. Karloff said it was the most trying ordeal he ever endeared. When in the wrapping, he had to be wheeled around the set (laughs) and he was quoted as saying to Jack, well, you've done a wonderful job, but you've forgotten to give me a fly. Silly guy, silly goose. You gave me a scarab instead. <laughs> These are, we're also planning to make a series of popsicle stick <laughs> jokes. And that's one of them. Allie Meekly popsicles. Yeah. What, uh, what does a mummy unzip to go to the bathroom? bathroom. A scarab. So, 
to let us let Pharaoh out. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter how grueling this was because the images of Frankenstein and the mummy were so astounding for its day that they were becoming instantly recognizable and they became the go-to for those creatures. If you're going to draw a mummy, it looks like the universal mummy that Jack Pierce made. Yeah. There's going to be Frankenstein. It looks like the Frankenstein that Jack Pierce made. He went on to do more Karloff makeup for Old Dark House and The Black Cat, both starkly different looks for two fantastic films for their era. He also did makeup for The Werewolf of London, which is one of my favorite makeup looks because I love it when werewolves wear clothes. Who, um, he was working that late? Werewolf Jack, of London? Wait, werewolf what am I of, thinking of? Oh, I'm thinking of an American werewolf You are thinking London. of an American werewolf in London, or which is, I, I believe, Rick Baker, which is yeah. uh, so, next year's Halloween yeah. person. <laughs> next year, the 80s. <laughs> so he does Werewolf of London, I, 1935. But the actor didn't want to go through the grueling makeup routine, refused to, and he wanted his face to show. So Pierce had to work around those things. I don't know if that frustrated him, but later we'll see Pierce's full idea for a werewolf come to fruition. <laughs> then comes what many people, including myself, think is the best of the Universal monster movies, The Bride of Frankenstein. I thought you said, oh, you said the, the creature, creature is my favorite, is favorite monster creature. design. The movies. I, I mean, that's I fair. I like the gay one. Uh, Bride of Frankenstein is the gayest of the Universal monster movies. Is it because of the homunculuses? It's the ballerina, the small ballerina under a, a glass. And I think this isn't for the general population, is it? This is for a special crowd. Uh, I forgot where I read that. Oh, there's like a book I have on horror movies and it has like a like, you know description synopsis and then like uh, how gay is like, it? How gay is it? How gay is this movie? This Mother is your Jones. Mother Jones movie guide that you're reading yeah. uh, synopsis how scary is it how gay is it okay is it oh uh, i won't be watching this one <laughs> it's by birdcage i don't think i'll be watching this one <laughs> yeah but i read this commentary on bride franks and the whole thing is like oh well there's all the the homosexual implications because of james whale i'm like oh, oh yeah. that's what <laughs> oh <laughs> dr oh. frankenstein dr frankenstein can't seem to get married <laughs> I hate Colin Clive. I just want to put, and for that matter, all the like white normal men of monster movies that are so forgettable are so boring. I mean, are they meant to be memorable? I, I, I have no idea. Then why even be there? Because you can't have the monster without the human. The you Hayes can't Code. have the beast without the beauty. Yeah, the Hayes Code <laughs> says- You gotta be an American man gotta there. Be, you gotta have a bland white man. You in gotta have a bland movie. white man who loves a woman after knowing her for a half an hour and he's obsessed <laughs> with getting married to her because that's the only way they're gonna have sex. So for the bride, who was- by the way, under a technicality, is married to Dr. Frankenstein, not the creature. So technically, she's married to Colin Clive. He took his name. <laughs> uh, we all come to this country with a weird name, and we all become Jack Pierce. We all become <laughs> Frankenstein. We want a good American name, As Frankenstein. Frankenstein, so then we can go by the baroness and confuse everybody later. That's what we want. That's the American dream. What did Count Orlock? <laughs> Count Orlock. I don't want my Greek name anymore. I want to be known as Count Orlock. I want to blend in to America. <laughs> I have to blend in. I have to carry my coffin around the street during the day. <laughs> even though that's how I die later. It's so all for the bride, Elsa Lanchester, the magnificent Elsa Lanchester. The script called for her to look like a mummy, which they're a part of it where she is wrapped up. And that is yeah. also very scary. It's like, what's going on? It's shaped like a va voom but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> is, is this the new Miss Contour competition? <laughs> but for her debut outside of the wrapping, Jack Pierce wanted to go for something completely different. And he went for a look, which I'll, I now I can't stop thinking about. He went for a queen, Nefertiti. Mm -hmm. A yes, the original yes queen. The <laughs> Yes, queen. Look it up if you don't know. Look up the the bust. Um, but it's the you know it's just a, Google bust. Queen of Egypt, and she has a big her her head juts out in the big kind of yeah. not cone but like the a cylindrical, original Marge Simpson. The original Marge Simpson. That's what he was going for. And now that I know that, I'm like, oh, that's pretty. They also that for that they had to put Elsa's hair in a big cage, as she said, and then give it the white streaks and right. tease it and everything. Yeah. And that was all done by Jack himself. He also gave her stitches around the lining of her jaw to remind us that she's another meat collage. Um, <laughs> a human casserole. <laughs> After Bride of Frankenstein, the Lemley sold off Universal and the next 10 years were going to be bumpy. Uh, but for the creature, as good as the work Pierce did for the monster and Bride of Frankenstein, it was noticeably different than the first film. The Frankenstein's monster from the first one is incredibly terrifying and the next one a little bit beefier. Um, <laughs> part of it was... Well, he's married now. Karloff, Karloff was not, no longer it's over. He was no longer a, a full honeymoon. What's that, howling in the distance? <laughs> I'm uh, turning into a matrimony <laughs> wolf. <laughs> <laughs> he got shot with an infidelity bullet. <laughs> So Frankenstein monster looks starkly different from the first one to the second one. A lot of it is that Karloff is no longer a starving actor. <laughs> so he's no longer as skinny and gaunt as he was in the original one. Some people make an argument that through the Frankenstein movies that the, the monster is evolving because if you think about it in Bride of Frankenstein, he's talking yeah. and the next one, his look continues to well, grow. I mean, once you start getting into the ones where it wasn't, where it was like Bela Lugosi playing, like son of, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's like basically just like a guy who has like a, almost like Andy Griffith, but like hairier. Formerly dead Andy Griffith. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Somebody put Goober and Gomer together and gave it a brain. And that's what we were saying. Gomer is the, the mechanic the, who's kind of dumb. Goober is... We got the best parts of both of them. <laughs> we got the Cary Grant capabilities of Goober. We got the military valor of Gomer <laughs> and the heart of Floyd the Barber. Oh my God. That's who Jack Pierce reminds me of. Yes, Floyd the is. Barber. Yes, he, that is General Whippersnapper himself, <laughs> Floyd the Barber. Floyd the Barber. Yeah. I was looking at a picture like, who does he remind yeah. me of? He reminds me of Floyd He's the Barber. He's basically a barber. Because too. he also wore like He's always kind of holding like a scissor. Yeah. Like, hey, and it, it being way too close. Oh, yeah. It was a good, it was a good, it was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear Carl Lemley? <laughs> but Pierce was finding new techniques to do things more effectively. So the creature was looking a lot different. So like he'd find shortcuts here and there that weren't necessarily bad, but he was just like, oh, what if I do this? And so he's still experimenting with a look. Also consider at the time, I mean, he might have plans, like notes he made of like yeah. how it's supposed to look. But the general public who saw the original Frankenstein like three years earlier yeah, or whatever yeah. with no, like the internet was invented well, like two years after this, <laughs> but like they couldn't go back and be like, wait a minute. Yeah, they yeah, probably yeah. didn't even remember they what he looked like. Didn't he, they, they probably <laughs> remember like, I think he has stitches in a black suit. Yeah. <laughs> He looked kind of like the president. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They weren't like ref. There was no reference. Yeah, there material. was not like, hey, wait a minute. That's not how Job of the Hut looked. Yeah, and there was no um, fans forced the people who make Sonic to make Sonic. Yeah, look more they like Sonic. didn't have to change his teeth to make <laughs> make him pull out the bridge again in his mouth. We like that one more. <laughs> this isn't the Frankenstein I grew up with two years ago, which was half of someone's lifetime back then. <laughs> so, like I'm saying, finding new techniques, and as time went on, these monster movies with without Pierce, makeup jobs for the creature for launching a junior and Glenn Strange would be done cheaper and faster. So more prosthetics were used, which looked bad. And they took this iconic look and drove it into the ground. That's bad in that every reproduction is less than the original. So if you ask a kid to draw Frankenstein's monster, you're going to get the things that Jack Pierce came up with, but you lose sight of how shockingly scary the actual makeup job on 1931's Frankenstein is, was what I'm trying to say is like, you're getting like less and less of the original one. So you're getting more iconic, but also kids are seeing the original, like when Frankenstein first emerges from the shadows, you're like, oh. Yeah, imagine, I mean, imagine yeah. like the only time you would have seen anything scary was when you saw like a dead body. A, a full dead body <laughs> in the street, which I mean, which was common. It's the depression. <laughs> Anyways, next up for Jack Pierce was the son of Frankenstein. But instead of Karloff getting all the attention for the makeup work, which he he was in this one, all of the great makeup work went to old, I don't need your help, Bela Lugosi, <laughs> who Pierce gave I a- got this removable mold no. I can use. <laughs> I'll do it. Get out of here. That's <laughs> my impression Blair. for Lugosi for everything. It's mine. Get out of here. <laughs> he played Igor and he got a great right. makeup job for this one. A lot of people give credit to his work applying- Yak's hair to the beard and blended in. More on that later. But didn't uh, Bella Lugosi also play Frankenstein the monster yeah, late, some, later yeah, in uh, like Abbott and Costello or like like House of Frankenstein or, or something Ghost like that? Ghost of Frankenstein. Or the Accountant of Frankenstein. The cold spots of Frankenstein. <laughs> um, Frankenstein <laughs> goes west. The Lord of the Frankensteins. Frankenstein goes Hawaii. <laughs> European Frankenstein, a Christmas Frankenstein. Frankenstein's um, European vacation. Frankenstein and the half blood <laughs> eagle. What? A lot of people give credit to, like I was saying, like the yak hair for the beard. But yak horror, hair won the Oscar that year. Uh, horror makeup artists really lose it over the broken neck bone that Pierce yeah, uses. Yeah, I remember that. It's just blended in like a big piece and, you know, he taps it. Ugh. He's also got, Lugosi also wore a contraption sewn into his clothes so he couldn't, like it stiffened his movements. <laughs> uh, and it was given rotten teeth to wear. All of this, yeah, this given, but all, all of that, like the, the hunchback, the broken neck, the teeth, all Igor. That's yeah. what we recognize as Igor. That spells Igor that to spells me. That spells Igor. <laughs> His love of Yak's hair truly paid off in 1941 when he was hired to work on the masterpiece, The Wolfman, mm. uh, starring Lon Chini Jr., who Karina Longworth hates. I was listening <laughs> to the Bala and uh, Boris episodes, and I've heard a lot of her podcast and a lot of nefarious characters and even Charles Manson, but no one's gotten her editorial scorn as much as Lon Haney Jr. Gonna, it's so funny it. to me. <laughs> it is so funny that she curses. The movie is how I first heard about Jack's work because I knew how insane it was to do the transform transformation scenes. Right. That's how I first heard about Jack yeah. Pierce. Working on The Wolfman also produced some of the most well-known photos of Jack Pierce. If you're wondering if you're familiar of what he looks like, if you've seen a photo of you've Lon Chaney. Andy Griffith show. If you've seen uh, Floyd the Barber. If you've seen photos of Lon Chino Jr. in Wolfman Gar pretending to hold a fist up to the makeup <laughs> artist, 
That's Jack Pierce. I feel like when Guillermo del Toro did his show at LACMA that there was a... The iconic picture of Jack Pierce I'm thinking of is the one where he's standing over Boris Karloff in the makeup chair and Boris Karloff has like a cup, a of, cup tea of tea. Or that, that one was for sure at the yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Benicio del Toro was also the Wolfman, not directed by Guillermo del no, Toro. certainly not. No. <laughs> When's the Benicio del Toro <laughs> retrospective coming to LACMA? Lon Chaney Jr. hated the process, which took nine hours, six hours oh to apply, God. three to take off. He hated being in a chair he didn't care much for Jack Pierce fine for the wolf I loved Lon Chaney Jr. I also recognized that he was a real piece of work for Spider Baby like father like, like son. son of Chaney <laughs> during Spider Baby uh, he was supposed to be kicking alcohol and he, the people were like why does he keep eating oranges because he was injecting vodka into <laughs> oranges and then eating them so I get all the criticism for the wolf band there was some prosthetics used like the nose was a prosthetic and he like was ashamed that he didn't know how to do those plastics so he like outsourced it to somebody but he didn't really tell a lot of people but that's the only prosthetic he used on the Wolfman is the nose. Um, some wigs like the pompadour were used and then hair pieces, but lots of the body and the facial hair were painstakingly applied. The yak's hair had to be applied in layers, trimmed to look organic, and then scorched with a curling iron. From then it was curled and then blended to look set. How many yaks were slaughtered, slaughtered. for this movie? Wait, there's only two more yaks in the world. and uh, <laughs> We only have enough yaks in the world for one more sequel. And we're getting tired of CGI. Practical effects are coming back. Coming back, yaks. Also, the Wolfman... <laughs> has lower fangs that jut out but no upper fangs but like he had that thing that yeah. was also underbite s- underbite yeah for the transformation scenes it was shot using time lapse and Lon Chaney would have to sit perfectly still four hours sometimes five hours at a time as they would shoot him in place then Pierce would come in do a small phase of the makeup then they would superimpose the changes and then it was that on repeat for like what nine hours of that <laughs> um that was a transformation scene that they were just like we can just make you just like, no more walking into the dark and then coming out of werewolf yeah. no <laughs> we're gonna watch you change and again no one ever saw a werewolf look like this before there's so little human resemblance other than that you know he's dressed like a 40s mechanic but like he looked more wolf than man in that one like the were- werewolf of london it was like a dude in like british clothes he had like a, a man man's face this one is like it's a wolf that's like walking up right it looks like a wolf man from this point on though he would continue working for universal but because the quality of the monsters and the monster movies dropped Mm -hmm. jack pierce wouldn't be creating as many masterpieces as he previously did people consider his work on claude rain's 1943 it's phantom of the opera as his last great work and it's amazing piece of just exposed flesh on the phantom's face was claude rain's or conrad veit the invisible man it was claude rains claude rains was i the think invisible in the, man. earlier in this episode i might have said it was conrad veit you're not smart um oh. but claude rains was the 43 phantom of the opera it takes off the masters exposed flesh people were really grossed out by this so i think he had to tune it back or they cut but that would people say that's his last great work and it's just mm-hmm. like this i motioned to around my eye <laughs> uh there were more mummy movies more frankenstein movies and from that point on where the monsters would cross over into movies Pierce would be tasked with having to do the makeup on several monsters in one picture. And because you can't spend eight hours applying makeup to three monsters, he would have to take shortcuts and use prosthetics. That's like House of Frankenstein where like everyone's in it. It's like just uh, hit some toilet paper, be the mummy. Put this fake beard on and put a bunch of fake beards on until it comes uh, up. Busy parents on Halloween. Busy parents. My uh, my parents on Halloween. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, We're going to come with you in foil and you can be Robocop. So the craftsman look of his work really peeled away. By the time we get to the mummy's tomb in 1943 and the mummy's curse in 1944, launching Senior Jr. was again on the seat and he did not want to go through the arduous makeup for the mummy so Jack Pierce created a, his first rubber latex mask mm-hmm. that he would wear and he did the best that he could the rubber mask may very well be the only artifact left behind from Jack Pierce's career that was in, used That's in the sad. movies yeah Bob Burns I think has it which is like the, the horror collector by 1947 though his meticulous methods of movie makeup which I wanted to say a lot were not working for the <laughs> studio anymore and they didn't really care about his craftsmanship anymore they wanted fast work done cheap and they no longer cared about the quality right. Universal at the time that doesn't with, sound like a movie studio. Uh, especially Universal. <laughs> Universal at the time merged with International Pictures after a decade of changing studio heads. Once the merger was done, many of the heads of different departments were fired. Jack Pierce was let go from his position. He worked for 19 years as the head of the makeup department for Universal. He would be replaced by Bud Westmore. Mm-hmm. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> who would go on to Bud. abuse West. West. No more. <laughs> From this point, Jack Pierce would be doing B movies and TV gigs, including the great TV show. He did you the makeup are- for B movie. He, he did a uh, makeup for You Are There, which is a great show. I, I mostly know it as a radio thing. Oh yeah, I think I've heard of it. It was the like radio. a uh, they pretend. 
to be their yeah. real journalists pretend to be on site for like the conquest of Mexico or Pearl Harbor and they pretend to be interviewing people. It's right. like a historical show that I wanted to do a similar thing but comedy but you shot me down because you don't like anything I like. Much like Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Much like Pearl Harbor. In 1957, Boris Karloff was a guest on the anxiety inducing show This Is Your Life uh. and he guessed almost automatically the clue was it took us about four hours and by this time <laughs> Boris is laughing. His surprise <laughs> guest was Jack Pierce on This Is Your Life and it's really beautiful to see these guys shake hand he like he goes up towering over Jack Pierce. you know Boris Karloff <laughs> don't rub it in Boris looks so you ever getting back in the baseball no. kiddo <laughs> <laughs> what are you like an ump now Boris Karloff compliments him calls him the best makeup man in the world and it's like genuinely like I, I love both these guys and I love yeah, Boris, Boris Karloff. Karloff is a class act class act and he just seems so happy to see Jack Pierce Jack Pierce brings him an electrode uh, that Frankenstein would wear <laughs> one more time one more time <laughs> one more time I got spirit gum in my pocket I always carry it on me I got the grease paint whatever that is and Pierce asks if Karloff remembers, do you remember coming over to my place in Encino to start work on Frankenstein? I tried looking it up and I couldn't find a place in Encino, an address. So I asked Maria from, who we know from the Andres Pico Adobe, who runs the Hollywood Exhumed Instagram, where she's always going to the homes of famous people. I asked her, like, hey, you know where Jack Pierce lived? And uh, she's like, let me ask Glenn Strange's niece. I was like, what? She found that Jack Pierce lived in Hollywood and Sherman Oaks later in his life. But she did find an address of his in Van Nuys, 4851 Havenhurst near Magnolia. But it's demolished, so don't go looking for it. But then she's like, oh, I got help from Marty McFly from SFV blog. I'm like, what's real and what's not? What's a movie? I can't remember. <laughs> what year is it? What? The actor? Year. <laughs> is it Twin Pines or Lone Pine? I need to know now. <laughs> is Biff cool or not? <laughs> what reality am I living in? Is he in Trump Tower or is he washing <laughs> mom's car? I need to know. Or is he somewhere in between? So by the time Jack Pierce passes away in 1968, his last well-known gig was working as the makeup department head for Mr. Ed. <laughs> If you like Mr. Ed, you must be thinking, how cool. If you don't like Mr. Ed, what a sad end for a true self-taught innovator and the man who visually created motifs we use almost 100 years today. In 2003, the United States Post Office did a series celebrating American filmmaking behind the scenes. The stamps... Sterling's here. So they wanted to do stamps commemorating them in behind the scenes. The stamp it's in question shows Boris Karloff being transformed into the creature and Jack Pierce's hands applying the <laughs> makeup. I'm, I'm going to do my Aaron Mankey now. Uh. That's right. His hands. In a series celebrating behind the scenes work, UPS decided to show his hands and not his face because who cares what he looks like because he's not in front of the camera. Here's to you, Jack Pierce. Jack Pierce's hands, the only parts that matter. Insulting. But He played a thing, though. The, the R2-D2 of the <laughs> Adam's Family world. But just before his death, TV stations would buy monster movie packages and began replaying them on TV, inspiring a new generations of kids to fall headstone over heels for monsters in the insane monster movie fandom of the 60s made kids like Joe Dante and John Landis worship the behind the scenes players like Jack Pierce. He was regularly featured in Famous Monsters Film Land, another staple for monster kids of that generation. So while his career seemed to have dried up near the end, I hope he had a few years of knowing how incredibly important his work was and how many people he inspired. As his work is... Truly iconic. Well, at least his hands are. <laughs> See that work on Mr. Ed? 